We present What Ho Jeeves by P.G. Woodhouse. Starring Michael Horton as Jeeves and Richard Bryars as Bertie Worcester. The mating season, episode three, Amorousness of a Newt Fancier. Since that evening, the previous summer, when Madeline Bassett, the sloppiest, mushiest, sentimentalist gourd helpers who ever thought the stars were God's daisy chain, had told me that if she ever found her betrothed, Gussie Fink Nottle, was not the rare, stainless soul she believed him, she would scratch his nomination and sign up with me. My whole foreign policy had been directed towards avoiding such a frightful disaster. And so when Gussie was jugged for wading in the Trafalgar Square fountain one night in search of newts, rather than let the grisly truth leak out, I checked in at Deverell Hall, Hans, home of Dame Daphne Wickworth, the Bassett's godmother, in his stead. The next day, Gussie himself, unexpectedly released by the beak, also turned up, giving his name as Bertram Worcester, and from then on, life at Deverell became nothing short of scaly. It was bad enough to be trapped in a den of slavering arts, lashing their tails and glaring at me out of their red eyes. It degraded the spirit to answer to the name of Augustus, that being to my mind about the ultimate low in names. But what really started to remove the stiffening from the Worcester upper lip after a day or so was the sinister behaviour of the above pink nozzle. Reckless of the fact that there existed at the Larches, Wimbledon Common, a girl to whom he had plighted his troth, it rapidly became apparent that he had fallen for Cat's Meat's sister, Corky Purbright, like a ton of bricks. And I wasn't the only one who noticed it. Five solid aunts had noticed it too. I was executing a quiet sneak through the Rose Garden on the Tuesday afternoon when Dame Daphne Winkworth hailed me from afar. Come here, old doctor. What? 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 what, what? Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> hello, hello. <laughs> so, doing the local green fly a bit of no good, what? <laughs> uh, quoting the rose trees? Don't talk to me about a rose trees. Oh, 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 no, 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 rather not, no. I, 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 I didn't particularly want to, actually. <laughs> what is this I hear? I, I, I beg your pardon? You would do better to beg Madeline's. Hey. When I was in the house just now, a telegram arrived for you from Madeline. It was telephoned, and as I was passing through the hall when the bell rang, I took it down. Oh, I feel white of you. Madeline says she has not received a single letter from you since you arrived here, and she wishes to know why. She is greatly distressed at your abominable neglect, and I am not surprised. I have no words to express what I think of your heartless behavior. That is all, Augustus. But, 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 that but, is all, Augustus. That, that is Gussie. Wait till I... Augustus? Uh, 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 yes? Are you not going straight back to the house to write to Madeline? Uh, no, no. Uh, uh, that, that, that is, uh, I've got to go into the village, don't you know? I want to have a word with uh, 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 Bertie Worcester. Is Mr. Worcester a friend of yours? Oh, oh yes, rather, yes. Uh, bosom. I see. Then uh, perhaps you could explain something to me. Why is it that we have seen so little of him at the hall? He seems to live in Miss Purbright's pocket down at the vicarage, regarding Deverell Hall as an hotel which he can drop into or stay away from as he feels inclined. <laughs> Yes, he, he, he does rather, doesn't he? He does. So, if you should have the exceptional good fortune to see Mr. Worcester, I should be grateful, Augustus, if you would mention to him that I shall be writing to his Aunt Agatha within the next day or two, and would prefer not to feel obliged to inform her that her nephew has fallen into the toils of a Hollywood film actress. Oh, no, I say, don't do that. Agatha Warperson would not approve of Miss Kerbright. No, absolutely. Uh, uh, look here, uh, don't write just yet. What? <laughs> see, I'll have a word with Ga 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 Worcester when I see him. Uh, uh, 
Very well, Augustus. You may go. <laughs> right ho, you blasted thing, muffle. You now have some bally explaining to do. Gussie! Gussie! Eh? Oh! Hello, Bertie. Not all. Come here. Now, what's all this about you not writing to Madeline? Madeline? Madeline. Oh, Madeline. Yes, Madeline. Do you realise she started sending telegrams about it? If you're not careful, she'll be down here in person to investigate. And silly asses will look if that happens. You must write today without fail. What? To Madeline? Yes, blast you to Madeline. I'll be blown if I write to Madeline. I'm teaching her a lesson. For what? Teaching her a lesson. I'm not at all pleased with Madeline. She wanted me to come to this ghastly house, and I consented on the understanding she came to and gave me moral support. It was a clear-cut gentleman's agreement. Yes, but all the And then, at the last moment, she coolly backed out on the flimsy plea that some games-playing school friend called Hilda Dutchin or something had suffered a disappointment in love. So she decided to go to Wimbledon to cheer her up. I was extremely annoyed, I can tell you. So I decided not to write to Madeline to show her she just can't do that sort of thing. Gussie, once and for all, will you or will you not go straight back to the house and compose an eight-page letter breathing love in every syllable? No, I won't. And now, Bertie, you must excuse me. Corky has invited me to tea at the vicarage, and I mustn't be late. Cheerio! But Gussie! Oh, dash, my fellow. Dash him, dash him. It was a Bertram Worcester with a pale, careworn face and a marked disposition to start at sudden noises, who sat in his bedroom about an hour later, rising occasionally to pace the floor. Few, seeing him, would have recognised in this limp and shivering chunk of human flotsam the suave, dapper boulevardier of happier years. The only thing to do, in my experience, when the morale is being given the sleeve across the windpipe like this, is to get in touch with Jeeves to see what he has to suggest. I had sent him a message, accordingly, via Queenie, the parlourmaid, and I was now waiting in my room for the sterling fellow to manifest himself. Ah, oh, Jeeves, I... Oh, catch me, dash it, it's you. What are you doing here? Queenie said you wanted to see me. You? Jeeves is the fellow I require. Well, Queenie said you were asking if you're a man. Don't forget, I'm your man at the moment, Bertie. As far as this pest house is concerned, Jeeves is in Gus's service. Oh, that's true, yes. Don't worry. Jeeves will be tooling along in a minute. I told him to rally round, as I guessed it was really him you wanted. Oh, fine. Incidentally, Catsmeet, since you happen to have raised the subject, where the devil have you been since last Friday? Eh? In your capacity as my gentleman's personal gentleman. I mean, dash it, you took on this job of valeting me of your own free will. So you should have been in and out the whole time, brushing here a coat, sponging there a trouser, and generally making yourself useful. And I haven't seen you once. One frowns on this absenteeism. Bertie, I came here to woo Gertrude Winkworth and persuade her to elope with me. Not attend to your blasted wardrobe. A chap can't press his own suit and another fellow's trousers simultaneously. It's too much to ask. Yes, but I... Now listen, old man, because I've got some good news on that front. Gertrude's showing distinct signs of yielding to my prayers. Don't actually buy the fish slice yet, but be prepared. Well, that's splendid, Catsmeet. I'm delighted to learn that someone's getting a break. But pigeonholing your love life for the moment, I... Ah, here's Jeeves. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Jeeves. You're just in time for a frightful piece of news, so be prepared to come across with something in the aid and comfort line if soon's all right speedily. Very good, sir. What is it, Bertie? Only that criminal lunatic Gussie. Mr. Pinknottle, Jeeves. Yes. What's he been doing? It's what he's not been doing that's the trouble. He hasn't written a single line to Madeline Bassett since he got here. And what's more, he says he isn't going to, to teach her a lesson. Well, Jeeves? This is a very serious situation, sir. You bet it's serious. I'm shaking like a leaf. Yes, girls of the Madeline Bassett type attach such importance to the daily letter. Exactly. And writing same was what Gussie came to this Edgar Allan Poe residence to do in the first place. Damn it, a spot more silence on his part, and La Bassett will come racing down here with her foot in her hand to investigate. And then what? Ruin, desolation, and despair. Precisely, sir. I think I know what's behind all this, Bertie. The trouble is that Gussie at the moment is slightly off his rocker. He's in something aided with Corky. What do I mean, Jeeves? Infatuated, sir. That's it. What I mean is, Bertie, is that he's got a crush on her. Well, I know that. So does everybody for miles around. It's the favourite topic of conversation when aunt meets aunt. Only just now, Dame Daphne Winkworth was moaning that Gussie never saw fit to put on the nose bag of the hall. And at lunch, Aunt Charlotte said she supposed they ought to consider themselves highly honoured that the pie-faced young bastard condescended to sleep in the valley place. Or worse, that effect. 
There has been a certain amount of comment in the servants' hall, too, sir. I'm not surprised. I'll bet they're discussing the thing in Basingstoke. Gussie lunches, teas, and dines with Corky. He seldom leaves her side. The human poultice, nothing less. You can't really blame him, of course, Bertie. Yes, I can. No, I mean, it isn't his fault, really. This is springtime, the mating season, when, as you probably know, a, um, a... Dash it, what happens in springtime, Jeeves? Sir? Uh, and the, and the pigeon comes into it, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yes, sir. In the spring, a livelier iris gleams upon the burnished dove. In the spring, a young man's fancy lightly turns to thoughts of love. That's right. Don't you see, Bertie? The sudden impact, plumb spang in the middle of spring, of a girl like Corky on a fat head like Gussie, weakened by constantly swilling orange juice, must have been terrific. Corky, when she's going nicely, bowls over the strongest. In my view, the poor goop is more to be pitied than censured. Yes, I hear what you mean. In fact, she's the one who wants censuring. She encourages it. No, I don't think she does. He just adheres. She does encourage him. I've seen her doing it. She flirts with him shamelessly. Don't tell me that a girl like Corky, accustomed to giving Hollywood glamour men the brusheroo, couldn't put Gussie on ice if she wanted but to. But she doesn't. That's what I'm beefing about, Catsby. She deliberately turns on the charm and gives him the old personality. Why? Because she's a woman, I suppose. Yes. The sooner that sex is suppressed, the better it'll be for all of us, in my view. Uh, <coughs> yes, Jeeves? It merely occurred to me, sir, that a possible explanation of Miss Purbright's indulgence of Mr. Think not all might be that the young lady wishes to make a gesture towards Mr. Haddock. You mean she's working this gussy continuity in order to stick the harpoon into Esmond? Well, precisely, sir. But why? She knows he's goofy over her, and thanks to your idea of a cl uh, Clark... Clark, yes, sir. A Clark uh, for him at the concert. It's now only a matter of time before he defies his arms and the sundered hearts are reunited. Perhaps Miss Purbright wishes to expedite the process, sir. It's possible, Jeeves. However, all this is rather by the way. Time is running out and we must do something. The Bassett, to judge from her recent telegram, is on the verge of being fed to the eye teeth due to an acute shortage of letters. While our correspondent on the spot, A. Fink Nussel, has stated categorically that not a smell of a letter does the girl get until she's learnt her lesson. So what to do, Jeeves? I would suggest, sir, that if Mr. Fink Nottle perseveres in his resolve not to correspond with Miss Bassett, the only feasible course of action that will remain will be for you to write to the young lady yourself. Me? Yes. But she doesn't want to hear from me. She wants to hear from Gussie. Certainly, sir. But, unfortunately, Mr. Fink Nottle has sprained his wrist and has been compelled to dictate his letter to you. But Gussie hasn't sprained his wrist. If you would be so, <clears throat> so good as to allow yourself to be guided by me, sir, Mr. Finkbottle gave his wrist a nasty wrench while stopping a runaway horse and saving a little child from a hideous death. Did he? When? Jeez, I think I get your drift. Would this be a golden-haired child with blue eyes, pink cheeks and a lisp? Very probably, sir. I think a lisp is good box office. Extremely good, sir. Golly, yes, I see what you mean. Gee, this is terrific. Thank you very much, sir. But Bassett will lap it up. Catch me, will you write the thing? Of course, it'll be pie. I've been writing go through that sort of letter since I was so high. Right ho, then. It ought to go off at once, every moment being vital. Will you do it now? Lead me to pen and paper, Bertie, and the job is as good as done. <laughs> As I curled up in bed that night and fell gently into a refreshing sleep, I must say I felt gay, bobbish, and even a daisy My heart, for the first time since I had arrived at Devereux Hall the previous Friday, had thrown off its burden of care and was actually doing soft shoe dances. In short, it was as if a great weight had been lifted from my mind. For Cat Sweet's letter, which I copied out and posted in time to catch the night mail, had been, in a phrase, the goods, and there was no doubt in my mind that it would put the stopper on the Bassett for a considerable time to come. Well, I don't know what your experience has been, but mine is that there's very little percentage in having a weight lifted off your mind, because the first thing you know, another, probably a dash sight heavier, is immediately shoved on it. It would appear to be a game you can't beat. At any rate, I'd scarcely opened my eyes the next morning, when in blue jeeves, 
and there was that in his mere appearance that chilled my merry mood like a slap in the eye with a wet towel. Jeeves's face is always grave, of course, but on this particular morning, he looked like an undertaker with a secret sorrow. Good morning, sir. Your tea? Uh, thank you, Jeeves. But I say, what's up for heaven's sake? Is something wrong? I regret to have to inform you, sir, that a somewhat serious crisis would appear to have been precipitated in your affairs. Oh, my face is not. Precisely, sir. Eh? What do you mean by that? It is with regard to Lady Warplesdon, sir. Aunt Agatha? Yes, sir. What about her? I have just been apprised by my Uncle Charlie, sir, who himself had previously received the intelligence from Dame Daphne Winkworth, that a letter arrived this morning from Lady Warplesdon, your aunt, sir, in which her ladyship announced her intention of visiting Deverill Hall in the very near future. She's coming here, you mean? Exactly, sir. But, but, but that's frightful, Jeeves. Inconvenient, certainly, sir. Inconvenient? It's not inconvenient. It's a grade A catechism. This is not like you, Jeeves, to fail to appreciate the gravity of the situation. Don't you see? If Aunt Agatha shows up at this ruddy hen coop, it won't take her two minutes to stop the oompus boompus. Hello, she'll say to herself. Why is my nephew Bertram calling himself Gussie Pink Bottle? And from there to complete shame and exposure will be the shortest of short steps. I wonder, sir... I say, Jeeves, you don't mean your great brain has clicked again. You haven't thought of a way out of this mess already. Well, sir, I have been musing, as is my wont, upon the psychology of the individual. What individual? My Aunt Agatha? Her ladyship, yes, sir. I wonder, sir, if you have ever had occasion to steal a cub from a tigress. No, I haven't. No, sir. I rather imagined you had not. But were that contingency to arise... Jeeves, uh, one minute. I don't want to interrupt you before you've really gathered steam, but the impression I'm receiving so far is of a salary attendant talking through the back of his neck. Uh, if I might explain, sir. Oh, right oh. I'm employing the tiger analogy, sir, merely in order to simplify the presentation of my thesis. Ah, I see. Yes, well, carry on, then. Thank you, sir. As I was saying... Were that contingency to arise, that is to say, of your stealing a cub from a tigress, it is likely, is it not, that the reaction of the tigress, assuming that she were a good and devoted mother, would be one of dismay, tinged perhaps with a certain apprehension? She'd be as sick as mud, I should think. Exactly, sir. And is it not also more than probable that the animal, once the loss of its infant had been drawn to its attention, would revise its social plans? in order to instigate an immediate search for the offspring. Yes, I suppose it is. What are you driving at, Jeeves? It occurred to me, sir, that were her ladyship to learn that Master Thomas, your cousin, uh, had disappeared from his preparatory school at Bramley-on-Sea, she might well feel obliged to cancel her plans for visiting Deverell Hall. Jeeves? Sir? You're not planning to kidnap young Thoth from his seaside boat? No, sir. I do not consider such drastic measures will be necessary. On the last occasion that Master Thomas was staying in your flat, the young gentleman confided in me that his favorite film actress was Miss Cora Starr, sir. Corky? Yes, sir. So I would imagine that were I to inform Master Thomas that Miss Purbright had invited him to stay at the vicarage here for a few days... There would be, as I believe the expression is, no stopping him. You're right, Jesus. Young Foss is a boy of volcanic passions. Right, oh then. How are we going to organize this operation? I would suggest, sir, that I repair to Bramley on Sea at the earliest possible opportunity today, with the expectation of delivering Master Thomas to the vicarage sometime this evening. Fine, but half a jiffy, Jesus. Isn't Corky going to be at a bit of a loss when he suddenly turns up? I have already considered that aspect of the matter, sir. I was talking with Mr. Purbright earlier in the servants' hall, and he undertook to inform Miss Purbright of the plan, giving it as his opinion that she would approve of it. Oh, how did you? Yes, Corky always approves of anything that seems likely to start something. Very good, Chief. Then I shall look forward to receiving a telegram from you sometime this afternoon bearing the news that stage one of Operation Tiger Cub has been successfully accomplished. Certainly, sir. I won't breathe freely until I know, Chief. Then the matter shall receive my early attention, sir. Thank you, Chief. Not at all, sir. 
that's me. Hello, Bertie. A couple of telegrams for you. Ah, good. Oh, but I say, they're addressed to Gussie. Well, of course they are, but they're for you. I don't know that, old man. They must be. You said you were expecting one from Jeeves telling you when the balloon had gone up. True, but the other may be a tender bobsworth from Madeline. I can't have it. Oh, Bertie, don't be goofy. Of course you can. No, Catsby. The code of the Worcesters restrains me. The code of the Worcesters is more rigid than the code of the cat's meat. A Worcester cannot open a telegram addressed to another. Even if for the moment he is that other. If you see what I mean. I'd have to submit them to Gussie. All right, but I think you're a chump. Now, Bertie, let's talk about something else. Can I borrow your car? What ever for? To take Queenie to the pictures in Basingstoke. Queenie? The parlourmaid. Yes, yeah, she wants cheering up, poor child. You've heard about her tragedy. She severed her engagement to the flatty dog. Oh, really? What went wrong? She didn't like him being an atheist. And he wouldn't stop being an atheist. And finally, he said something about Jonah and the whale, which it was impossible for her to overlook. So this morning, she returned the ring, his letters, and a china ornament with a present from Blackpool on it, which he bought her last summer while visiting relatives in the north. It hit her pretty hard, I'm afraid. She's passing through the furnace, so I'd like to slap balm on the wounded spirit if it can be managed. Oh, right ho. Charge ahead, then. Thanks. Oh, it's curious how, when you're in love, you yearn to go about doing acts of kindness to everybody, isn't it? I'm bursting with a sort of yeasty benevolence these days, like one of those chaps in Dickens. I very nearly bought you a packet of cigarettes in the village this morning. Hello, hello. Your fingers are twitching, Bertie. Is the code of the Worcesters about to spring a leak? Well, you're thinking that the Worcesters must be pretty priceless asses to let themselves be ruled by such a code, eh? Uh, yes, in a way. Oh, uh, oh, go on, Bertie. Open the damn thing. Uh, well, I, uh, yes. I must know, Jashin. I must. Uh, now, let's see. Uh, oh, 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 Lord. Oh, my golly. This one is from the Bassett. And Catsbeat, listen to this. Think Nuttall, Deverell Hall, King's Deverell, Hans. Letter received. Cannot understand why not had reassuring telegram. Sure you concealing accident terribly serious. Fever anxiety. Fear worst. Arriving Deverell Hall tomorrow afternoon. Love, kisses, Madeline. Oh dear. Quite. This will require a little management. Absolutely. Of course, for sophisticated handling, we shall have to think it over. Think it over? Action is what we want, Catsby. Sharp, decisive action as dished out by Napoleon. Well, it'll have to wait anyway. Wait? Yes, I must be getting back to Queenie now. We'll deal with this later. But, but, but I, I... Oh, you wouldn't want to stand between a poor, heartbroken girl and an afternoon treat at the cinema, would you, Bertie? Come now. Catsby, you know full well that if you went through the West One Postal District with a fine tooth comb and a brace of bloodhounds, you wouldn't find more than about three men readier than Bertram Worcester to sympathise with a woman's distress. But at the moment, I haven't time to mourn over stricken parlourmaids. All the mourning at my disposal is earmarked for Worcester B. There's no panic, Bertie. Listen, be in your room as soon as possible after dinner, and I will be there with a whole plan of campaign cut and dried. All right? Well, I, I, I suppose so, yes. Yes, all right. Righto, then. Toodle pit, Bertie. Toodle pit. And, of course, it being so vital that we should get together with a minimum of delay, that night turned out to be the one night when it was impossible to take an early powder. Instead of the ordinary dinner, a regular binge had been arranged, with guests from all over the countryside. No fewer than ten of Hampshire's most prominent stiffs had been summoned to the trough, and they stuck on like limpets. It wasn't till close on midnight that the final car rolled away. And when I bounded to my room, off duty at last, there was no sign of cat's meat. Jeeves, however, was back on the strength. Good evening, sir. Evening, Jeeves. Well, how did it go? Most satisfactorily, thank you, sir. Thanks to your telegram, by the way. Not at all, sir. I delivered Master Thomas to the vicarage earlier this evening, and I have just learnt from my Uncle Charlie that her ladyship, your aunt, has postponed her visit to the hall. Good, good, good. That's excellent. And where's Catsmeet? Now, Mr. Purbright has taken your car and gone to London, sir. He asked me to inform you of the fact. London? Whatever for? It is the gentleman's intention, I believe, sir, to drive down to Wimbledon Common early tomorrow morning to seek an interview with Miss Bassett. And? Sir? Oh, what's he going to say to her? I have no idea, sir. I was not privy to the gentleman's plan. Oh, you mean he didn't confide in you? Precisely, sir. That sounds ominous. Well, thanks anyway, Jeeves. You'd better push off to bed. Thank you very much, sir. Good night. Oh, I beg your pardon, sir. 
Mr. Finknottle, sir. Ah, come in, Gussie. Good night, then, Jeeves. Good night, sir. Well, Gussie? Oh, what a tedious evening, eh, Bertie? Not too good, no. And to think I could have been spending all that time with Corky. Quite. But you couldn't boil out of a big dinner party, could you? No, that's what Corky said. She said it wouldn't do. Noblesse oblige was one of the expressions she used. Amazing what high principle she has. You don't often find a girl as pretty as that with such high principles. And how pretty she is, isn't she, Bertie? Or rather, when I say pretty, I mean angelically lovely. Her face wouldn't stop a clock, certainly. What do you mean it wouldn't stop a clock? She's divine. She's the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. It seems so extraordinary that she should be Purbright's sister. You would think any sister of Purbright's would be as repulsive as he is. I call Casmead rather good-looking. Oh, I disagree with you. He's a hellhound, and it comes out in his appearance. There are newts in that fountain, Gussie, he said to me. Get after them without a second's delay. And wouldn't take no for an answer. Urged me on with sharp hunting cries. Yoikes, he said, and tally ho. What I came about, Bertie, was to ask if you could lend me that tie of yours with the pink lozenges on the dark grey background. I shall be dropping in at the vicarage tomorrow morning, and I want to look my best. <sighs> it's in the wardrobe. Oh, thanks. Ah, here it is. Fine. Oh, uh, by the way, Bertie, you remember pestering me to write to Madeline? Well, I've done it. I wrote to her this afternoon. What? Yes. But, but, but why are you looking like a dying duck? But Because Catsmeat and I wrote a letter for you yesterday in which we said you had a sprained wrist and couldn't write. Did you? That's most officious of you, Bertie. Not in the best of taste, if you want my view. However, I suppose it doesn't really matter, because what I said in my letter was that everything was off. Off? Yes. I've broken the engagement. I've been feeling for some days now that Madeline, though a nice girl, won't do. My heart belongs to Corky. Well, good night again, Bertie. Thanks for the tie. Good night. Oh, no. The Larches, Wimbledon Common, was one of those eligible residences which you pass on the left as you drive out of London by way of Putney Hill. And on the following morning, its commodious grounds, in addition to a lawn, a summer house, a pond, flower beds, bushes, and an assortment of trees, also contained one Worcester, noticeably cold about the feet, and inclined to rise from 12 to 18 inches skywards every time an early bird gave a cheep over its worm. This Worcester, to whom I allude, had run up from King's Deverell on the 254 milk train, and it was his intention, should the feat prove to be within the scope of human power, to intercept and destroy Gussie's letter to Madeline Bassett. And so it was that at eight o'clock precisely, I could have been seen crouching in a bush hard by the dining room French windows, watching with bated breath as the housemaid, who had just deposited the morning's post by the breakfast plates, left the room and closed the door behind her. The time had come for action, and action there was. I did not linger or dally. All a passerby, had there been a passerby, would have seen, was a sort of blur. Ten seconds later, I had Gussie's bit of trinitropoluol in my hand. To trouser it was the work of an instant. To reach the window again with a view to a quick getaway, that of an instant more. And I was on the point of passing through when I caught sight of a large framed photograph on the windowsill. It was a speaking likeness of Madeline Bassett. And as I gazed at those large, saucer-like eyes and took a square look at those quivering lips, something went off inside my being like a spring. I had had an inspiration. Events were to prove that my idea was just one of those that seemed good at the time. But at that moment, I was convinced that if I were to snitch this portrait and confront Gussie with it, bidding him drink it in, his better self would get it up the nose, and all the old love and affection would come surging back. Accordingly, I scooped the bally thing in, and was making for the French window again, like a man on a walking tour, diving into a village pub two minutes before closing time, when I saw, to my horror, Madeline Bassett approaching across the lawn. I turned and headed for the door. There was a sound of someone hefty, presumably the Bassett's solid school friend, the one whose sex life had recently stubbed its toe, coming down the hall. I felt like a stag at bay. In fact, if you describe Bertram Wooster at this juncture as all of a doodah, you'd not be far wrong. 
I sprang to the window. The battock was closer. I sprang back. The footsteps were heftier. Finally, I sprang sideways, my eye having been caught by a substantial sideboard in the corner of the room. I was behind it with about three seconds to spare. Right-o, Percy. Into the garden with you. Oh, oh, oh that fearful racket and frightful hound. Now, there's the cricket news. 146 for eight? God! Oh, hello, Madeline. Good morning, Theodore. What a lovely, lovely morning. I don't see what's so particularly hot about it. Personally, I find all mornings foul. Oh, Hilda, don't be sad. I've been gathering flowers, beautiful, smiling flowers, all wet with the morning dew. How oh, happy flowers seem, Hilda. Well, why shouldn't they? What have they got to beef about? <sighs> this fellow says Surrey might win the county championship this season. A fat chance. Your back, Percy. All right, up here. Hello there. Yes? There's no letter from Gussie. Oh, I'm still worried. I think I shall go down to Devil by an earlier train. Oh, don't you know. I can't help having an awful feeling that he's seriously injured. He said he'd only sprained his wrist, but has he? That is what I ask myself. Suppose the horse knocked him down and trampled on him. He mentioned it. But he wouldn't. That's what I mean. Thus he's so unselfish and considerate. His first thought would be to spare me anxiety. Oh, Hilda, do you think his spine is fractured? What rot! Spine fractured my foot. If there isn't a letter, all it means is this other fellow, what's his name, Worcester, has kicked at acting as an amanuensis. But I don't blame him. He, he's dizzy about you, isn't he? That? Yes. Mm. He loves me very, very dearly. It's a tragedy. I can't describe to you, Hilda, the pathos of that look of dumb suffering in his eyes. I mean, well, then, the thing's obvious. If you're dippy about a girl and another fellow has grabbed her, it can't be pleasant to sit at a writing table, probably with a rotten pen, sweating away while the other fellow dictates, my own, comma, precious darling, full stop. I worship you, comma, I adore you, full stop. How I wish, comma, my dearest, comma, that I could press you to my bosom and, and cover your lovely face with burning kisses, exclamation mark. I don't wonder Worcester kicked. You're very heartless, Hilda. I've had enough to make me heartless. I sometimes thought of ending it all. I've got a gun in that drawer there. Hilda? Oh, I don't suppose I shall. Too much fuss and bother. Oh, oh, Percy, stay! Have you seen the paper this morning? It says there's some talk of altering the leg before wicket rule again. Odd how your outlook changes when your heart's broken. I can remember a time when I'd have been all excited if they'd altered the leg before rule. Now, I don't give a damn. Let them alter it, and I hope they have a fine day for it. What sort of fellow is this, Worcester? Oh, uh, dear. He must be. If he writes Gussie's love letters for him, either that or a, a perfect sap. If I were in your place, Madeline, I'd give Gussie the air and, and sign up with him. Being a man, I presume he's a louse like all other men, but he's rich, and money's the only thing that matters. Oh, Hilda, darling. Oh, oh, oh sit still, Percy. Oh, oh, all right, blast you. Buzz off if you want to. Hilda. What now? My photograph. Where is it? Oh, I don't know. I expect Jane has smashed it. What's the matter with you, you silly ass? Hello, hello. Hilda, what are you doing with that pistol? Don't get excited. I'm not going to shoot myself. It would be a pretty good idea at that. There's a man behind the sideboard. Oh! Come on out of it, you! I've been wondering for some time where that curious breathing sound was coming from. Percy spotted him. <laughs> at a voice, Percy. Nice work. Come on, you! Out! Hello. A dreadly criminal, though shop soil. One of those Mayfair men you read about, I suppose. I see you've got that photograph of yours, Madeline, and probably half a dozen other things as well. I think the first move is to make him turn out his pockets. 
No, I say, I really, I mean... Bertie! Bertie? This is Bertie Wooster, the complete letter writer. What's he doing here? And why has he swiped your photograph? I think I know. Then you're smarter than I am. Goofy, the whole proceeding strikes me as. Will you leave us, Hilda? I want to speak to Bertie. Alone. right -o. May as well take my letters, I suppose. Though I doubt whether there's anything worth reading in them. Come along, Percy. Oh, oh. Where is Bertie? I say, thought I'd look in. It occurred to me you might be glad to have the ladies' bulletin about Gussie, so uh, I popped up on the milk train. <laughs> Gussie, I'm glad to say, is getting along fine. <laughs> the wrist is still stiff, but the swelling subsiding and there's no pain. He sends his best. <laughs> um, you're probably asking yourself what I was doing behind that sideboard. I parked myself there on a sudden whim. <laughs> you know how one gets these sudden whims. And you may be thinking it a bit odd that I should be going around with this studio portrait in my possession. <laughs> well, I'll tell you. I happened to see it on the windowsill there, and I took it to give Gussie. <laughs> I thought he'd like to have it to buff him up in your absence. He misses you sorely, of course. And uh, it occurred to me that it would be nice for him to shove it on the dressing table and... Uh, Study it from time to time. No doubt he already has several of these speaking likenesses, but uh, a fellow could always do with one more. What? Oh, Bertie. Oh, Bertie. Do you read Rosie Ann Banks's novel? No, not very frequently, no. They sell like hot cakes, Bingo tells me. You've not read Marvin Keane Clubman? Uh, no, I missed that. Good stuff? It's very, very beautiful. Oh, I must put it on my library list. Are you sure you've not read it? Oh, quite. As a matter of fact, I've always steered rather clear of Mrs. Bingo's stuff. Why? It seems such an extraordinary coincidence. Shall I tell you the story of Marvin Keane? If you want to, certainly do. Very well. He was young and rich and handsome, an officer in the Coldstream Guards, and the idol of all who knew him. Everybody envied him. I don't wonder, lucky stiff. But he was not really to be envied. There was a tragedy in his life. He loved Cynthia Gray, the most beautiful girl in London, but just as he was about to speak his love, he found that she was engaged to Sir Hector Molevera, the explorer. Dangerous devils, these explorers, you know. You want to watch them like hawks. Well, in these circles, of course, he would have refrained from speaking his love. Kept it under his hat, I suppose. What? Yes. But he went on worshipping her, outwardly gay and cheerful, inwardly gnawed by his ceaseless pain. And then one night, her brother Lionel, a wild young man who had unfortunately got into bad company, came to his rooms and told him that he had committed a very serious crime and was going to be arrested. And he asked Marvin to save him by taking the blame himself. And of course, Marvin said he would. <laughs> Silly ass. Why? For Cynthia's sake, to save her brother from imprisonment and shame. But it meant going to choke him himself. I suppose he overlooked that. No. Mervyn fully realized what must happen. But he confessed to the crime and went to prison. When he came out, grey and broken, he found that Cynthia had married Sir Hector, and he went to the South Sea Islands and became a beachcomber. And time passed. It would, of course. And then, one day, Cynthia and her husband arrived at the island on their travels and stayed at Government House. And Mervyn saw her drive by. And she was just as beautiful as ever. And their eyes met. But she didn't recognize him because, of course, he had a beard. And his face was changed because he had been living the pace that killed, trying to forget. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of a good one I heard the other day. The pace that kills nowadays is the slow, casual walk across a busy street. What? <laughs> hey? <laughs> Hang on. Thank you. He found out that she was leaving next morning and he had nothing to remember her by. So he broke into government house in the night and took from her dressing table the rose she had been wearing in her hair. And Cynthia found him taking it 
And, of course, she was very upset when she recognised him. Oh, she recognised him this time? He'd shaved, had he? No. He still wore his beard. But she knew him when he spoke her name. And there was a very painful scene in which she told her how he'd always loved her and had come to steal her rose. And she told him that her brother had died and confessed on his deathbed that it was he who had been guilty of the crime for which Mervyn had gone to prison. And then Sir Hector came in. Ah, oh, good situation. Strong. And, of course, he thought Mervyn was a burglar, and he shot him. And Mervyn died with the rose in his hand. And, of course, the sound of the shot roused the house, and the governor came running in and said, Is anything missing? And Cynthia, in a low, almost inaudible voice, said, Only a rose. That is the story of Mervyn Keane Clubman. I see. Very nice. Oh, Bertie. I ought to have given you my photograph long ago. I blame myself. But I thought it would be too painful for you. Too sad a reminder of all that you had lost. I see now that I was wrong. You found the strain too great to bear. At all costs you had to have it. So you stole into the house. Like Marvin Key, and took it. What? Who oh, no. knew? No. Yes, Bertie. There need be no pretenses between you and me. And don't think I'm angry. I'm touched. More deeply touched than I can say. And oh, so, so sorry. How sad life is. You betcha. You saw my friend Hilda Garchin. There's another tragedy. Her whole happiness has been ruined by a wretched quarrel with the man she loves. A man called Harold Anstruther. Really? Yes. They were playing in the mixed doubles in a tennis tournament not long ago. And according to her, I don't understand tennis very well, he insisted on hogging the game, as she calls it. She complained. And he was very rude and said she was a rabbit or something. And so directly the game was finished... She broke off the engagement, and now she's broken-hearted. She doesn't look it. Hello, hello, hello. Madeline, what do you think this is? A groveling letter from the boyfriend, no less. He surrendered unconditionally. He says he must have been mad to call me a rabbit, and he can never forgive himself. But can I forgive him? Well, I can ask that one. I'm going to forgive him the day after tomorrow. Not earlier, because we must have discipline. Oh, hell. How glad I am. <laughs> I'm pretty pleased about it myself. Good old Harold. A king among men. But of course, needs keeping in his place from time to time and has to be taught what's what. what. <laughs> I, must, I mustn't run on about Harold. <laughs> what I came to tell you was that there's a fellow outside in the car who wants to see you. To see me? So he says. Name of Purbright. Why, it must be your friend Claude Purbright, Bertie. I wonder what he wants. I'd better go and see. You must be brave, Bertie. Some day, another girl will come into your life, and you will be happy. When we're both old and grey, we shall laugh together over all this. Laugh! But I think, with a tear behind the smile. Goodbye. Well, what's for old bloke? Oh, got an old bird. Hello, Walter. I keep feeling there's something familiar about your name. I must have heard Harold mention it. You know Harold Anstruther? Father, yes. He was my racket partner in my last year at Oxford. <laughs> of course, yes. Well, Harold speaks very highly of you, Worcester old-timer. And I'll tell you something. I have a lot of influence with Madeline, and I'll exert it on your behalf. No, no. I talk to her like a mother. Oh, dash it all. We can't have her marrying a pill like Gussie Fink Nottle when there's a racket blue on her waiting list. What? Well, that's quite good of you, but no. No, no. trouble, Worcester, old cock. <laughs> Courage, old man. Courage and patience. Come and have a bit of breakfast. Uh, thanks, old friend. Now, I must be getting along. I'd like to catch cat's meat uh, per bright, you know, before he goes. Oh, right here, then. Pop off. But I'm going to have the breakfast of a lifetime, even if you're not. 
haven't felt so roaring fit since I won the tennis singles at Rodin. Cheerio, Worcester. Cheerio. Uh, cheerio. Now, where's Catsmeat? Catsmeat! Catsmeat, don't go without me! Catsmeat! Oh, how the fellow. Oh, Episode, the parts were played as follows Jeeves, Michael Horton, Bertie Richard Bryars, Cats Meet Purbright, Kenneth Fortescue, Gussie Finknottle, David Valor, Madeline Bassett, Bridget Armstrong, Dame Daphne Winkworth, and Hilda Gungeon, Miriam Margulies. The episode was adapted for radio by Chris Miller from the book The Mating Season by P.G. Woodhouse. <laughs> The program was produced by Peter Titheridge. Uh.